There is hardly any view that is more widespread than the view that somehow or other the Great Depression was produced by a failure of private business. The Great Depression. The Great Depression of 1929 devastated the U.S. economy and one-third of all banks failed. It was so severe that one in every four adults lost their job and homelessness increased. Housing prices plummeted, international trade collapsed, and inflation soared. It was just one year after the Great Depression and America hadn't fully recovered from the blow yet. Howard Buffett had brought his son Warren to New York City. The New York Stock Exchange, often nicknamed the Big Board, is the world's largest stock exchange by market capitalization. Men in jackets were all roaming randomly, shouting and scribbling on the trading floor. Four or five years, the stock market has been booming along and uh, presumably forecasting better business, which has really not materialized. Young Warren was fascinated to see all this. He was finding beauty amidst the chaos that was happening around him. He was deeply interested in numbers and reading books at a very young age. He started loving the game of business and investing before he could realize it. Little did he know, his love for the game would make him the greatest investor in history and also create a financial behemoth, Berkshire Hathaway, that is now worth over $695 billion. This is the story of the greatest investor and above that, a great human being. Childhood. Buffett was born in Omaha, Nebraska on the 30th of August, 1930. His dad, Howard, was a stockbroker. His mom, Layla, was a housewife. Buffett had two sisters, one older than he and one younger. As a kid, Warren used to write numbers on the chalkboard and read books at his dad's brokerage firm. He described his father as affectionate and inspiring. I admired everything about him to the extent that I was absorbing lessons from him without knowing it. He credited him for a lot of his success and says he introduced him to investing in books. Buffett went to Rose Hill Elementary School in Omaha. He loved numbers as a kid and would collect things like stamps and bottle caps. His love towards business was particularly heightened after reading a book called 1,000 Ways to Make $1,000. Warren started selling Coca-Cola, chewing gum, Saturday Evening Post, Liberty Magazine, Ladies Home Journal, you name it. He even sold popcorn at football games at the University of Omaha. He loved the concept of compound interest and Albert Einstein has said that compound interest was the eighth wonder of the world. It's a pretty simple concept, but over time, it accomplishes extraordinary things. Warren's early investments. At the age of 11, he bought his first stock. It was an oil and gas company called City Service. He bought three shares at $38.25. A short time after Buffett bought these shares, the price dropped to $27 per share but an anxious and scared Buffett held on tight and waited until the price increased to $40, at which point he waited until the price in profit. After Buffett took his profit, the stock price increased to $202 in a short while, and he realized he could have made a lot more. From this early investment, he says he learned a lot, to wait and not rush into decisions without proper reasons. In 1942, Buffett's dad was elected to serve his first term in Congress. The family moved to Washington, D.C. He also started a paper route and worked weekends at his grandfather's grocery store. Initially, he delivered papers for the Washington Post, but because he was so business-minded, he even started delivering papers for the Washington Post's rival, the Times-Herald, along the same route. With this job as a paper boy, he was able to build up a nice savings account. When he was 14, he and a friend bought pinball machines to put in barbershops. It was called the Wilson Coin Company, and they split the profits with the barber who owned the shop. Buffett graduated from high school in 1947 at the age of 17, with a caption under his yearbook picture reading, Likes Math, a future stockbroker. The not so great college life. He didn't want to go to college considering the amount of money he was already making. Not willing to disobey his father's words, he enrolled at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. I was buying stocks. I mean, I actually was having a pretty good time and I didn't see that really was much to be gained by going to college, but my dad kind of jollied me into it. During his two years of studying business, he wasn't happy and felt he knew more than his professors, 
so he transferred to the University of Nebraska, where he earned a degree in business administration at 19. Warren Buffett has a reputation for being a prodigious reader, spending as much as six hours per day reading books and newspaper. He said it himself, I just sit in my office and read all day. Meeting with Ben Graham. After graduation, Buffett wanted to go to Harvard Business School. Sadly, he got rejected. Sometimes in our life, rejection becomes a great blessing. When I got to the University of Nebraska, I applied to Harvard Business School. They told me I was to get interviewed in a place near Chicago. I got there and uh, he interviewed me for about 10 minutes. And he said, forget it. <laughs> You're not going to Harvard. And so now I'm thinking, what do I tell my dad? You know, this is terrible. And it turned out to be the best thing ever happened to me. He instead went to Columbia Business School. Buffett picked Columbia because of Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor. Buffett said it's the best book about investing ever. He knew he had to go to Columbia when he heard that Graham taught there. Buffett says Graham is one of the most influential people in his life after his father. It is there that Warren had learned the two most important rules of investing taught by Ben Graham. Rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. Ben Graham basically coined the term value investing. The following six principles are derived from Ben's book so that you can find it useful. Here are a few ways that you can be as prepared as Buffett when you make investment decisions. Make sure you're getting the investment at a good price. This makes the investment safer in the long run. Ask yourself if the investment is long-term. The best investments give back over time instead of offering immediate gratification. Research if the business is well-managed. Buffett scrutinizes decisions that management are making to ensure that if the company falls on hard times, the best decisions will be made. See if the business avoids debt. Buffett doesn't invest in companies that have too many debts to pay off. Also check out the company's returns. Buffett seeks out companies with a return on investment higher than average. See if the business has a competitive edge in its industry. Buffett was introverted, shy, and nervous, so he decided to take a Dale Carnegie public speaking class. He says this was one of the most important investments and that he wouldn't be where he is today if he hadn't taken that class. My whole life would have been different. So in my office, you will not see the degree I got from the University of Nebraska. You'll not see the master's degree I got from Columbia University, but you'll see the little award certificate I got from the Dale Carnegie course. After graduating, Buffett went back to Omaha to continue working in his father's brokerage firm, as Ben Graham hadn't wanted to hire him because of some personal reasons. In 1954, Ben Graham changed his mind and called Buffett to work under him in New York. Without thinking twice, Warren agreed. He spent most of his time at the partnership looking for opportunities and analyzing reports. He became more interested in how companies worked and thought about their management when making investment decisions. But Graham was more leaned towards balance sheets. In 1956, Warren decided to take things on his own. Eventually, Buffett Associates Limited was born. A total of seven family members and friends invested $105,000 with Buffett only investing $100. By the end of the year, he was managing around $300,000. In 1959, Buffett talked to one of the partners, who was a doctor, and asked if he could get another 10 doctors to invest $10,000 each. He got 11 doctors to invest. In 1962, the partnership was worth $7.2 million, and Buffett decided to merge all the partnerships into one, forming Buffett Partnership Limited. The minimum investing amount was 100 grand. It was also the same year that Warren met his lifelong friend and business partner, Charlie Munger. When I first met Warren back in 1959, I recognized immediately that he was a very intelligent. Buffett Partnership Limited continued to be very successful. In 1966, assets were rising over $44 million, so Buffett decided to stop any new investments. Berkshire Hathaway. Buffett bought the first shares of Berkshire in 1962, which was a textile business back then. The business wasn't doing well, and it was closing its mills and selling shares. At one point, the management asked Buffett at what price he would buy its shares. Warren replied, $11.50. In 
The tender offer came out a few months later and the price was $11.375 per share. Though Warren was angry at the way the management acted, Warren immediately got a hold of the opportunity and bought more stocks. At one point, he was the majority shareholder and he immediately felt he would need to change the management, and he did exactly that. Warren began investing in insurance companies, and in 1967, he bought the National Indemnity Company and the National Fire and Marine Insurance Company. Eventually in 1970, Buffett became the chairman of Berkshire Hathaway and wrote his first annual letter to the shareholders. These letters would later become very famous and something studied by many investors all over the world. Charlie Munger Warren made a ton of money by applying Ben Graham's principle of picking stocks, which was to buy stocks at cheap prices. At this point in time, Warren didn't really care if it's a lousy company or had lousy management. Warren was confident that he was going to make money anyway because of the cheap prices at which he picked his stocks. Charlie Munger changed his perspective. Munger advised him to pick wonderful companies at fair prices rather than his previous thought process of picking fair companies at wonderful prices. This move was so pivotal because it enabled Berkshire to scale at a level which otherwise would have been impossible to achieve. This made Warren think of stocks as businesses rather than just stocks. Charlie and Munger became mental partners from the day they met. This resulted in some of Warren's most iconic and most profitable stocks, which includes Apple, Coca-Cola, Chevron, Bank of America, Geico, etc. Since Warren becoming CEO of Berkshire, he has generated over $790 billion in net value to himself and his investors, and his Class A shares of Berkshire rose to almost 4.3 million percent since its start. Moat Investing in 1971, Buffett bought a company called Seize Candy for $25 million. This investment was crucial for Berkshire Hathaway. It was a trademark move for the company, investing in businesses that they believed to have a moat. It means the company's ability to maintain competitive advantage over the rest of the industry and maintain its market share. As Buffett always says, the single most important decision in evaluating a business is pricing power. If you've got the power to raise prices without losing business to a competitor, you've got a very good business. The moat concept is especially true in insurance businesses. Buffett's success is largely due to his acquisition and involvement in the insurance business at Berkshire Hathaway. Other insurance claims aren't paid as soon as the insurance companies collect premiums. The cash stays with the company and is called float. With its insurance business, Berkshire Hathaway has a float that was $39 million in 1970 and is now over $100 billion. This is used by Berkshire to invest, essentially giving it a huge interest-free loan. As Buffett says, we enjoy the use of free money and, better yet, get paid for holding it. In 1983, Buffett set his sights on Nebraska Furniture Mart, so he walked in to speak to the owner and offered to buy it. A deal was struck for $60 million, and Buffett shook hands. Within days, a contract and check were sent. His strategy or philosophy behind these businesses when asked, Buffett says, What we're trying to find is a business that for one reason or another, because it's the low-cost provider in some area, because it has a natural franchise due to its service capabilities, because of its position in the consumer's mind, because of a technological advantage or any kind of reason at all, has this moat around it. In 1988, Berkshire began to buy shares in Coca-Cola. With around 400 million Coca-Cola shares to date, Berkshire's yearly dividends rose from $88 million in 1995 to $672 million last year. Time is a friend of the good businesses and the enemy of the mediocre. Warren Buffett Buffett didn't invest much in the dot-com bubble and shied away from most tech stocks. He knew the hype would eventually become a bubble sooner or later, and indeed he was right. When we look back at the investing philosophy he learned from Benjamin Graham, it's obvious that the tech companies during this time didn't represent the kind of companies he looked for. In this time period, many people thought Buffett had lost his touch, with Barron's even writing, what's wrong with Warren? Although Buffett has never had a big interest in technology companies, he does hold one investment which falls perfectly into his approach of finding businesses with a moat. In 2013, he bought a 13% stake in Verisign, 
which holds the exclusive rights to the dot-com domain. During the financial crisis, which is the period from 07 to 08, Buffett bought large stakes in companies like Goldman Sachs and General Electric, which made him billions of dollars in returns a few years later. His political views and philanthropy. Buffett, who grew up as a Republican, as his father was a Congress Republican, his wife Susan saw the pain black Americans were going through and was much involved in the civil rights movement at that time. This made Warren change his political view and become a Democrat. And he started donating to charities under one organization. Hence, the Buffett Foundation was formed. The Buffett Foundation is a charitable organization formed in 1964 in Omaha, Nebraska, as a vehicle to manage his charitable giving. It was renamed the Susan Thompson Buffett Foundation in honor of his wife, Susan Buffett, who died in 2004. His Philanthropic Pledge In 2006, he made a commitment to gradually give all of his Berkshire Hathaway stock to philanthropic foundations. Buffett said, I couldn't be happier with that decision. More than 99% of my wealth will go to philanthropy during my lifetime or at death. Some material things will make my life more enjoyable Many, however, would not. I like having an expensive private plane, but owning a half dozen homes would be a burden. Too often, a vast collection of possessions ends up possessing its owner. The asset I value most, aside from health, is interesting, diverse, and long-standing friends. My wealth has come from a combination of living in America, some lucky genes, and compound interest. Both my children and I won what I call the ovarian lottery. For starters, the odds against my 1930 birth taking place in the US were at least 30 to one. Me being male and white also removed huge obstacles that a majority of Americans then faced. Since then, Buffett has donated nearly $36 billion to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, along with other numerous charitable causes. Bill Gates also tweeted that Warren's generosity has moved him to tears whenever he thinks about that. Rather than letting his life be dictated by his huge wealth, he lived a humble lifestyle and appreciated the close group of people around him. In February 2011, Buffett attended a ceremony at the White House where he, along with 14 others, received a Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is America's highest civilian honor. It was awarded by President Obama. As Buffett always says, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. After all is said and done, he'll go down in the history books as one of the greatest investors and businessmen of all time, a humble and generous man who enjoyed and understood business, or simply the game.